Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, January 25th, 5.30 a.m. Central Time as I speak. Uh, Joe's out today, so I have Matt Bennett with me this morning. We're going to start off with some more news about ADM. ADM's nutrition unit has, uh, you, excuse me, ADM's nutrition unit helped executives earn over $70 million. Uh, so earlier this week, we discussed how ADM's nutrition unit is under investigation for its accounting practices. Despite only making up less than 10% of the company's revenue, the sector has heavily influenced recent executive bonuses. In 2020 and 2021, ADM's board tied a large share of senior executives' stock bonuses to the growth of its nutrition unit. According to ADM, the changes were made to focus on growth within the sector. Between 2020 and 2022, the company's top seven executives received shares valued at almost $72 million. So uh, should farmers be concerned about all these issues with ADM? <laughs> uh, let's see. You know, that what you just said is frustrating. I will say that, okay? If if you set something up as a company to where uh, the performance of a given department is going to impact you personally on a financial scale, and then it appears that maybe there's been some accounting creativity, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that frustrates me. Now, should farmers be concerned about the viability of the company? I don't believe so. That's, that's my personal opinion. I don't have... Um, you know, any more intel than what you do. I actually broker through ADM Investor Services. Uh, it, the two companies are not tied financially, although they do have some, of course, ties. But bottom line is, I think that farmers um, farmers should know uh, at this stage of the game from everything that I'm being told that everything's fine as far as doing business with them. It's just that anytime a company has a situation like you just described, it's going to make people very upset. Um, you know, when you stop and think about what would 70 million do, for instance, you know, spread out amongst a, a bunch of growers, right? you know, and, and it would have made, it made quite the difference, you know, for people. So yeah, it's an aggravating situation, but I really don't know if I would say that farmers should be concerned about doing business with them uh, necessarily either. Right. It'll be interesting to sit back and see as more comes out about this situation. For sure. Yesterday, LanzaJet opened the world's first ethanol to sustainable aviation fuel production facility, Freedom Pines Fuels. The facility is located in Soperton, Georgia, and is expected to produce 10 million gallons of sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel annually. The Biden administration is calling for at least 3 billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuel to be produced annually by 2030 to reduce aviation emissions. The technology used at this facility will cut greenhouse gas em emissions by more than 70 percent. According to Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack, the facility will provide new economic opportunities for America's agricultural producers. As SAF continues to grow, how big of an impact will this have on the ethanol industry? A lot, ha a lot of folks have said that um, sustainable aviation fuel is the last viable option to keep the industry alive. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Okay, so ethanol start needed a lot of tax credits. It needed a lot of help from the government to be able to to make it work, right? So mm -hmm. now ethanol is standing on its own, but it's not a growing industry. I'd say it's a mature industry to say the least. Is is it getting smaller? You know, no, not necessarily, but it's just, is it growing? And, and do people, are people making the amount of money that they want to make to stay in the business? And uh, we've seen some consolidation there, which would lead you to believe that maybe they're not uh, making uh, the kind of money they would want to make. What would sustainable aviation fuel mean? I mean, I, I'll tell you, Kenzie, I've been talking about this quite a bit in my presentations. When you look, for instance, renewable has been a hot topic. You guys have talked about it. I've talked about it with you. Uh, we know that renewable is growing, obviously, demand for crush. We know soybean oil that used to be kind of the ugly stepchild type situation uh, for soybean meal. Now everyone wants both, right? So, mm -hmm. but sustainable, the amount of demand that would come due to sustainable with corn based ethanol being the preferred feedstock would absolutely dwarf what renewable diesel uh, is going to generate now 
both renewable and sustainable need a significant amount of tax credits to make them work. So, you know, while it sounds fantastic that uh, the president is saying 3 billion gallons by 2030, we are heavily reliant upon Washington, D.C. to make sure that this actually is something that's going to occur and something that they're going to continue to support. So with it needing the tax credits for it to be able to remain financially stable, I think is a, a little concerning to me. But these people opening this plant didn't open it because they thought that it was only going to be viable for a little while. There's a lot of investment going in renewable fuels. And I think that's really, really exciting for the U.S. producer. Do you think there's a chance things could change in D.C. and they wouldn't allow uh, sustainable aviation fuel to be made from corn based ethanol? There's a chance, but you know, when you talk to folks like, uh, I know Jim Leesmeyer with Pro Farmer writes about this quite a bit, you know, he, he feels good. I mean, he's not saying it's going to happen. He just feels good that they're going to go ahead and support this uh, moving through. And so uh, with that being the case, uh, it's supposed to happen this spring. I mean, mm -hmm. this is coming right around the corner. It's like a greets is what they're calling it uh, act or whatever. And so if that is the case and that happens, um, yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, Kenzie, this could be massive as far as, uh, you know, how many plants you're going to need. I mean, would you say these guys are 10 million gallon? Yeah. A 10 million gallon will take, I mean, you need yeah. what, 300 plants. I mean, I mean a lot of plants. you need a ton of plants. And yeah. with that being the case, it, it, there is some serious growth potential, which would be not only good for the U S producer, it'd be good for rural America because we know that's where those plants are going to be jobs. You name it. Uh, you guys can feed DDGs. Uh, you know, they will be in plentiful supply. Um, but you know, it's fun to talk about, but let's see it really happen. If it does, I think we're all going to be very happy. Glencore and Viterra have filed a lawsuit against Louis Dreyfus. According to the lawsuit, Louis Dreyfus artificially inflated and manipulated cotton prices back in 2011. The manipulation caused Glencore and Viterra to lose over $200 million to, to their, due to their big short positions. While the companies had these short positions, Louis Dreyfus built a massive long position and chose to take physical delivery. As a result, short sellers were only able to exit their positions at artificially inflated prices, according to Viterra and Glencore. Between July 2010 and March 2011, cotton prices tripled, reaching a record high of $2.20 per pound. Through the years, we've seen all kinds of price fixing cases within the ag industry. You and I both know this. Do you think Glen Glencore and Viterra have a leg to stand on here with this uh, lawsuit? I think, you know, Joe's out, out of the office and I think you're trying to get me like killed or something with some of these <laughs> questions you're asking this morning. Do I, do I think they have a leg to stand on? Uh, they have a case. There's no question. Right. Uh, here's whenever someone's building a massive long, but yet it looks like they're manipulating information. I mean, that's, that's a major no, no. Uh, I don't know, you know, what actually happened. Uh, all you can go on is allegations, of course, but um, is this case going to be heard and potentially go, you know, clear to the Supreme Court? I'd say it could, you know, things like this are not taken lightly. Um, you know, the frustrating thing, I think, for all of us, Kenzie, is that, you know, there's price fixing. And then, of course, you've got politicians that actually trade some of this stuff. Um, that's super frustrating to me, because if they're going to have anything to do with how something like this turns out, you got to ask yourself, you know, how are they connected? You know, mm -hmm. and sometimes, sometimes they're connected. That's the unfortunate reality. But yes, I, I do think they probably have a like, stand on whether, again, I don't know the whole details of the case. I just know that this isn't something that you mess around with. Right. So ethanol production declined significantly last week. Weekly output of 818,000 barrels was down 22% on the week and down 19% versus the same week last year. Ethanol stocks were pegged at 25.8 million barrels. The print was up marginally compared to the previous week and up 10% compared to the same week last year. Implied gasoline demand was down 4.8% compared to the previous week and down 2.2% versus the same week last year. On average, over the last four weeks, implied U.S. gasoline demand is down marginally versus the same period last year. What's your take on this week's numbers, specifically the substantial drop in production? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. Real quick, uh, people weren't driving as much. It was super cold. It was snowy in places. That one's the easy one. As far as the lower production, um, 
you know, so JSA is our sister company and they deal with a lot of ethanol plants. They deal with end users, but specifically they do deal with ethanol plants. This is something we talked about last week on our call. When it got super, super cold, uh, these guys were actually selling that gas, you know, instead of running the plant, they were calling it like a warm or hot idle, I believe is what some of these folks were calling it. And so they were making an incredible, you know, amount of money instead of running their plant actually selling that gas out there on the market, back out on the market. So uh, do I expect that next week we're going to go right back to the 103 to 106 level? Not necessarily, but Kenzie, this was uh, definitely an outlier. There's a reason and a good reason that this happened, and it's not going to happen again next week. I think you'll be back in the mid to high 90s. Uh, you know, I think a lot of these folks came right back online with the warm up. Uh, the cold snap is exactly what caused what you're talking about this morning. Right. Uh, farmers are continuing to protest over in France. Yesterday, farmers blocked roads, lit hay on fire, and sprayed liquid manure on government buildings throughout France. The protests are in response to government regulations, cheap imports, and rising costs. We've been seeing these protests for a while now. Uh, French farmers claim their livelihoods are in danger as food re retailers bring down prices after a period of high inflation. Additionally, farmers say they must receive higher prices for their products due to the extra work and costs required by the EU's Green Deal. The French government is expected to soon make proposals to appease to appease farmers. Um, some say these regulations that they are pushing on farmers over in Europe will soon make their way to the U.S. Uh, do you think that could someday happen? And also, how do you think the situation is going to shake out over over in Europe? Do you think they're actually going to satisfy the farmers with some different propo proposals? First of all, uh, don't set hay on fire. I need hay, like really bad. <laughs> that was the same hay thing in, I thought too. Hay in Illinois is of scarce supply. I mean, if you had a bunch of hay and you want to make money, you go to any sale barn in central Illinois, especially, and you're going to sell it for whatever you want to sell it for. This is a mess over here. Okay. So some of these deals that you're putting together, uh, this green deal, I mean, it sounds like the, you know, some of the stuff that we've heard tossed around in the U S um, you know, is, is, uh, environmental concern, something that we should all have. Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, I'm like the seventh generation on our farm and thank goodness, uh, everyone on our farm was an environmentalist before I still wouldn't be there. You know, I mean, they took care of the farm. It's in good shape. It's been in good shape for almost 200 years now. And I do think that most of these producers over there uh, in Europe, uh, France is what you're talking about right now. Uh, I think that they're good producers as well. And so, you know, I think that whenever the government gets involved in some of this, uh, you know, they can screw up a good thing very rapidly. Now, as far as the price situation goes, producers have got to know the way that the market works. Uh, if this could particular situations driving, you know, for instance, consumer prices may be a little bit lower and the producers happen to spend more to produce it. I think that's a that's tough. I mean, that's a tough ball game. I can understand why they're frustrated. Uh, is this going to come to the U.S.? There's people that would give anything for this to be in the U.S. right now. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is that a lot of those people, Kenzie, don't know their freaking rear end from a hole in the ground and they don't know anything about production agriculture. And we still have people in the world that aren't getting food whenever you're saying that we're overproducing food. So it's a screwed up system. It's got to do with politics and it's got to do with money. And quite frankly, I think it stinks. Yeah, it's very concerning what's going on. Uh, cattle futures had a positive uh, day yesterday. Feeder cattle futures closed an average of 53 cents higher. Live cattle closed an average of 61 cents higher. Box beef may have finally found a top. Choice end of the day at 299.50. That was down 216. Select end of the day at 287.24. That was down a buck 14. Thank you for joining me this morning, Matt. Everyone have a great day and we'll talk to you tomorrow.